So greetings, everyone. Uh, my name is Peter Young, and uh, I am a member of the Committee of 100 and also chair of the Committee 100 Asian American Career Ceilings uh, Initiative. Uh, this, if you can believe it, is the 18th uh, event that we've had since we started these uh, this series uh, in February of uh, 2020. Um, and uh, we <laughs> had hoped to do some in-person events and we hope to get to that uh, uh, at some point, uh, but these have been um, uh, virtual webcasts and have been very, very popular. And we tried to cover all different angles of the issue, whether it's academics who've done research uh, studies on, uh, on exactly what does the data show to people who have succeeded in different, uh, different industries uh, to millennials. We had a group of four millennials who just talked about their experience uh, as millennials. And so we've tried different angles, including we had an event uh, where it was just focused on how to create, how can we do better, creating new ideas on how we can do better. Um, we're going to continue this series. We have a one coming up on April 19th, uh, which is called Running uh, for Office. And we have two wonderful uh, panelists, uh, Alan Fung, who is uh, was the mayor of Cranston, Rhode Island for 12 years, termed out and is now running for Congress. And uh, William Tung, who, uh, uh, who is the attorney general of Connecticut. Both have wonderful insights. And in fact, both ran in districts that had relatively few Asian Americans. So they didn't, uh, they didn't win because uh, there were a lot of Asian American voters. Uh, so that's on April 19th. It will include a welcoming comment from our chairman, uh, Gary Locke, who, as you know, was a governor of Washington State, uh, Secretary of Commerce and ambassador to China. And he'll, he'll give his welcoming comments about his thoughts on running for office. So uh, this program uh, is really designed to help uh, the audience either be educated or uh, uh, start a dialogue uh, or, or uh, essentially learn some lessons from, uh, from people who are looking at this from different angles. This is a unique panel because this is about families and this is about how one raises your kids and how that uh, influences their success in getting through uh, career ceiling ceilings. Uh, and this is a particularly nice panel because we have four panelists, two of whom are immigrants themselves, Sunil Kumar and, and uh, Enrique Kumar, uh, and two who are the children of immigrants. Uh, but in all cases, including that's Alice Young and Amy Chua, uh, in all cases, they have children, so they're dealing with this next generational uh, issue of how to raise the kids, but they had to deal with, uh, e you know, how to deal with their parents when they were trying uh, to succeed and grow up and uh, not end up just scientists and, uh, and doctors, right? So uh, this is going to be very interesting. Uh, this is a fireside chat, so I'm going to pose some questions uh, and um uh, and really let the uh, let the panelists really speak. Um, the biographies are in the invitations, so I'm not going to uh, uh, repeat. Uh, we'll start out though, and I'd like each of you to take two or three minutes, just tell the audience a little bit about yourself, but also how you're connected to this topic. You know, whether you're an immigrant who raised kids in this country or you're a child of immigrant, but how do you feel connected to this topic? So um, I'm just going to start out. Let's start out. Uh, arbitrarily, we'll start with, with Sunil and uh, then to go to Rika, Amy, and then Alice. Thank you, Peter. This is a very, very interesting subject and you constructed it uh, in a manner which makes it possible to communicate the thoughts on, and uh, our experiences. Well, I came to America in 1971 with a college degree, which, which is the, really the the common method for most Indian Americans. They would first get an undergraduate degree in India and many of us went to the same university. Many of us went to the Indian Institute of Technology and, and then we came here in the late 60s and up to mid 70s. Then I did an MBA in a second rate university in uh, Louisiana. 
And we lived in the South for quite a few years. We lived in uh, uh, first in Arkansas, first I went to college in Louisiana, then we lived in Arkansas, then we lived in Indiana for, for 12 years. Indiana is sort of still in the South. In fact, it was part of the uh, Dixie uh, Kingdom at, or Dixie Nation at that time. And then we returned to live in Nashville, Tennessee for some years. And we lived in New Jersey for about Last 15, 25. Uh, last 25, 25. years. Uh, but the reason I mentioned that is it is relevant to the experiences. So we had a chance to raise our children uh, quite a bit in the Southern states. And then later, only in the last few, uh, really the last few years five years of their high school, school was in New Jersey, but uh, the, most of the schooling was, was in the South. And really, uh, I'm glad you've chosen three women because this subject is really more about mothering and less about fathering. So that you will hear much more interesting and much more insightful comments from Amy and Alice and Enrico. And just to, to say, uh, Sunil was a very successful CEO of, of both public and private companies and sold the last business that he ran for uh, 3.2 billion and now is a, is owns a number of smaller companies. Uh, and he has, uh, uh, quite a few kids and quite a few grandchildren, right? Yes. yes. Rika, you and want to, uh, you, uh, so two or three minutes about your own background? Um, <clears throat> so, um, thank you, Peter. Um, hello, everybody. My name is Rekha Kumar, and I moved to U.S. in 1975 after getting married to my wonderful husband of 48 years. And before I moved, I had a bachelor's degree in chemical engineering. And I came here, had my kids. And at the same time, I went to college to get, I was working and went to college to get my master's in mechanical. So um, I did my bachelor's in India and master's here. So then I started my career in Union Carbide as a design engineer for batteries for tiny small batteries. Then I worked for GM as a plant engineer and, <clears throat> and US Navy as a project manager. So couldn't hold my job because my husband keep uh, <laughs> moving around, he got transferred. So now I am focusing all my energy uh, and time for philanthropy. And we have three kids all married, all settled, and seven grandchildren. Okay. And the oldest one is nine, and the youngest is two. Yeah, and we'll get into sort of how you managed manage to raise your kids and how they ended up where they ended up. So Amy, uh, you're next. Okay, great. Hi, everybody. Um, so I was born in Champaign, Illinois, um, to two Chinese immigrant parents who came over in a very common pattern in the 60s to uh, basically study at MIT to do graduate school there, chemical engineer, one of them, electrical engineer, the other one. Um, I grew up the first seven years in West Lafayette, Indiana, and it was a pretty typical um, immigrant kid upbringing. I was really old school, strict parents. Um, uh, thrown into nursery. My, my first language was Fukianese, uh, Hokkien Chinese. I was thrown into nursery school um, at the age of four, speaking not a word of English, kind of sink or swim. Um, I was the only Asian kid, I think, in the entire school, in, or maybe at least my class in West Lafayette, Indiana. Um, I'm the oldest of four daughters. We all stuck out big time, like outsiders. Uh, the ones with the funny haircuts. I, I just tweeted a picture of myself with this completely straight, um, you know, my mother cut my hair. Um, the one with the funny clothes, we didn't have much money. So it was always like the imitation Adidas, the fake Levi's. Um, I had a strong accent growing up. Um, in fourth grade, we moved to Berkeley, California. And, but I was always still an outsider there, uh, even though there were lots more Asians in California. I think my parents, for some reason, just raised us really much more traditionally in some ways. Um, and then all the stuff that I wrote about, uh, partly tongue in cheek and battle him. You know, we had to get straight A's. Um, we had to be the best at everything. 
absolute respect for elders. My parents were extremely strict socially, which I actually did not like. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that later. Um, but um, I felt my parents were, they were wonderful parents. I'm lucky they're still alive, but I felt they were too narrow in what they wanted me to be. Peter was joking, but I definitely, they wanted me to be a doctor. And when I told them that I applied to law school, my mother burst into tears and wouldn't talk to me for a week. Um, and anyway, so that's it about me. I'll just say that I'm also famously and stubbornly tried to raise my own two daughters the same way my parents raised me. So I can talk a little bit about that later. <laughs> okay, great. Alice, and by the way, uh, for those of you who may wonder why my last name and Alice's last name are the same, it's because we're brothers and sisters, but we're also both members of the Committee 100. So we're stuck together. So Alice, <laughs> just don't say anything mean about me, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, I am the um, eldest um, child of um, a Chinese diplomat who came to the United States in the 40s. And then when it, the communist takeover occurred, he became an immigrant professor. Uh, I was born in Washington, D.C., and people still look at me and say, nobody was born in Washington, D.C. Where were you really born? Where are you really raised? You know, so uh, that's, we went to, I went to 13 different schools in 12 years. My parent, my father was a professor, not a military person, but he kept moving uh, jobs and um, locations. So we went, we lived in different states in different countries. Uh, we lived in Japan for a while. We lived in Honolulu. Uh, and so I, the only real continuity in my life in terms of, of uh, relations was really family. Um, I then, uh, my parents didn't have very much money. So I went to the University of Hawaii for my freshman year of college, which was free and then got a scholarship to Georgetown and went there for my sophomore year and then got into Yale in the first class of women. So went there my junior and senior year, continuing this itinerant um, approach to uh, moving around, uh, then went to Harvard for law school, uh, went to, and uh, like Amy, when I told my parents I was going to go to law school rather than to Harvard's PhD program in history, my father for 10 years refused to say that I was a lawyer. He would just say, ah, oh, she went to Harvard <laughs> because he was so embarrassed that I was in um, a, a field that he didn't really know much about and didn't care very much about. Um, and so I literally went to law school not knowing what a corporation was, um, completely a neophyte in the area of law and uh, went on to forge a career, ultimately chaired the Asia practice at various Wall Street law firms uh, and uh, really had a chance over time to mentor a lot of, a lot of people and help them through what uh, Amy describes as it was a, an extremely strict um, kind of Asian upbringing of parents who really didn't know much about the US social network as such. So I literally was not allowed to go out. Um, I wasn't allowed to go to my proms <laughs> in school. Uh, so it was really a very strict upbringing and I changed it somewhat when I was raising my kids. Yeah. Okay, so we're, we're, we're sort of segueing into the, ne the next question. Uh, by the way, I will add to what Alice said and said, uh, my parent, my father said, there are two professions I really hate, lawyers and business people. <laughs> and there are three kids and uh, Alice went into law, I went into <laughs> business and my younger sister went into law. So, uh, so it was a tragedy for them. So uh, the next question- We were not too obedient, I guess, we the, obedient. in the end. So, uh, so uh, in a sense, all four of you have touched on the next question, which is maybe if you could touch on what were some of the philosophies and experiences uh, that you have as either immigrant parents, right? In the case of Sunil and Rika, 
or uh, being raised by immigrant parents. What are some of the key things that you, you philosophies and experiences that, that you want to convey to the audience? So, uh, you know, Rika and, and Sunil, I mean, uh, as immigrant parents, what, what, how did you figure out how to be parents in a country where you didn't grow up and, uh, and where the culture is quite different? So, <clears throat> Peter, for, um, it's a daunting task, especially for mothers, how to raise your children, especially we grew up in Indian culture and the culture here is so different. So I, I really was very conflicted, but then we both talked about it and decided we want to raise our children as Americans. And, and the uh, Indian culture can come later on. So, <clears throat> so we did all the festivals. I mean, the fun Halloween, Thanksgiving, Christmas, except for the church part. It was only the uh, prizes, <laughs> presents. Um, but all the Christmas dinners and everything. And so our kids are grown up and now they feel um, they want to be part of Indian culture so that they can pass it on to their children. So it's very amazing how things come back in a circle. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, yeah. And when, the, see, when I came to America in 1971, see, I came to Louisiana, a small town in Louisiana. And there, there were no other Asians at all. Okay? And I, I stuck out like a sore thumb, somewhat like Amy was describing earlier. But I never felt like an immigrant. I mean, I came across nothing but welcoming, warm-hearted people. And from day one, they invited me to their church. I, I don't know why it was so, but it was very much so. And I knew I looked different and did have an accent, but I didn't feel different. So, so when we got married, it was to me natural and, that we raise our kids to be like, like the neighbors. And, and uh, when I came, I came to Arkansas, yes, Arkansas. and a very, very small town in Arkansas, Magnolia, there were no foreigners, no foreigners just no. Sunil and me. But everybody welcomed us, and um, we, we didn't feel like a foreigner. At all, at all. And, and <clears throat> so when our children grew up, uh, and we'll, we'll end it with that, because we wanted to go on to other panelists, we let them choose. So our two daughters did not date any Asian in their entire dating career. They only dated Caucasian, and they ended up marrying two. Our son, on the other hand, chose on his own. We did not influence any of them. He dated primarily yes, in, 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 people yeah. of or ladies of Indian ethnicity and ended up marrying one too. So it, it was entirely their own free will, free decision making uh, based on we, where. <clears throat> yeah. And they, frankly, they didn't have too many Asian friends too when they were growing up, except our daughter went to MIT. MIT is highly, uh, has a higher concentration of Asians than most of the schools. So she ended up having the majority of her friends being Asian and really more specifically of, of Chinese ethnicity because, because of the college she went to. So, yeah. Did you, uh, did you try direct them at all towards specific uh, professions or schools or so forth? And, yes. and if you yes. did, yes. what was behind you know, yes, that, that philosophy? So, Peter, one thing we didn't care about, culture would come later, but <clears throat> they had to do engineering. There was no other <laughs> and, and the reason I was, mean, <clears throat> and the reason was we said that you may even become, decide to become an artist later on, and that'll be just fine, but at least get some grounding that you can earn a living. Okay? No, but passion and professions are two different things. But you should at least be able to earn a living. But later on, you can always branch out. Yeah. And indeed, only one, one stayed in engineering. Uh, she, she, uh, uh, the middle daughter, went, even though she went to MIT, she later on became a doctor. Yeah, and, but she uh, did medical engineering. Yeah. By so, so that's so, all, but nothing else. We didn't, so yeah. Peter, in that regard, there was not, no negotiations, nothing. And and did they and, resent did they resent that at, at no, the end about it? No, no, no. no. Yeah. no. All right, okay. Nothing to resent about. Interesting, Amy. So again, what were some of your experiences, philosophies, 
uh, and you can comment both in terms of being an immigrant child, a child of immigrants, but also then as you raised your kids, right? In terms of philosophies, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, and, and we've read the book, so, so, yeah. so we have some basis. <laughs> I think I'll talk more about my parents because there's some stuff that people might not know. Um, I think I, in retrospect now, I think I was incredibly lucky that I was raised by, in a totally contradictory household. Um, so my father was actually, he pretended to be a traditional guy to make my mom happy, but he was actually a complete wild man, like a rebel. He was the black sheep in his family, his Chinese family, he was the middle child. He came to America, he hated the Philippines. Um, and from the beginning, you know, my dad always actually wasn't traditional. He whispered in my ear, invent your own field. So it was very contradictory because he was saying you have to go into science or get a PhD, but he would always say, do your own thing, invent your own field. He wanted to try everything in America. So even at a young age, we did crabbing, fishing, clamming, you know, uh, he taught me how to use a chainsaw and an ax, you know. And then on the other side, my mother was as traditional Chinese as you could be. And I'm very grateful for that too. She, um, she's the one that insisted we speak Chinese at home, taught me how to write Chinese. Every English word I said in the house, one whack of the chopsticks um, and taught me Chinese history. And there's one story when I was in fourth grade, um, I had a strong accent and I pronounced the word restaurant wrong. I said restaurant. And this horrible kid named Jeremy started running around the field playground saying, oh my God, restaurant, restaurant, and just making fun of me, chinky eyes, you know. And I remember coming home and telling my mother about this, you know, feeling terrible. And I'll never forget, my mother was mad at me, furious at me, not the kid. And she said, Amy, if this stupid boy, you know, he doesn't even know anything. He doesn't know that we come from the oldest, most magnificent civilization. You know, we invented everything. Why would you care what he thinks? You know, why would you waste one second thinking about this stupid boy? And it's funny that might've seemed unsympathetic or like a non sequitur, but since, you know, for the triple package book, I, it turns out it's a very, it's actually a, a documented phenomenon where immigrant kids, sorry, immigrant parents instill in their children a sense of pride in their heritage. And it becomes almost like a kind of armor um, to fend off discrimination and prejudice. And that was certainly the case for me. I think my parents, um, so, so there was like my dad secretly being just like this pure American. And then my mom instilling a sense uh, very much of, you know, kind of pride in my heritage that worked out. So I'll let, I'll, I'll go on to talk in the next questions, but I think um, I have a lot of positive things to say about the way that my, my parents raised me. Um, uh, mostly being able to recover from failure, I would say. And then my complaints, I'll come back, is what everybody's alluded to, although in an interesting way, I definitely felt too constrained. Like Alice said, I was obedient on the outside, but I had to do a lot of sneaking around and training my parents. Um, maybe I'll wait to the next question to- good. So See, Actually, that's a good segue to Alice because there was a lot of trying to get around the rules. By the way, I want to make one comment, though, about what Sunil said, because I think it's important, and that is it does matter uh, when you arrive in this country and how many uh, Asians are in your community. I mean, your experience about the fact there was no one who was Asian in a funny way probably was helpful. I mean, um, Alice and I, when we were growing up in Virginia, Maryland, we went to a school, we were the only, the only three Asians were the three of us kids. <laughs> but the funny thing is, it's kind of, they don't discriminate as much if they just sort of treated us like aliens from Mars, right? We're <laughs> like a curiosity. So, but the problem of course is as a minority gets bigger, yes. it, becomes, it becomes more natural for them to be discriminated against. So it's a kind of interesting yeah. thing because today I'm sure Alabama, Rika oh, yeah. is not yeah. the same experience right. that you went through, right? That's so right. Alice, you're next. So philosophy's experience. You know, as, being, being yeah, as, as Peter pointed out, we, you know, we grew up all over the place, but one of the places was McLean, Virginia, when it was a little tiny town. 
And there were only three Asians in the school, me, my brother, and my younger sister. And so I was always really excited that my teachers remembered my name. I figured I had made a wonderful, um, uh, that, that they recognized how smart I was and whatever and the fact was I was the only minority in the entire school um, until Peter came so they they knew my name uh, oddly enough there was an there was a social studies film which Peter may not have seen but um, it was our friends and neighbors and they had a, a social studies segment on communism this is in the uh, third grade and uh, the communist happened to be a Chinese face. And so at the end of the movie, it was a black and white movie, they, turned, they uh, said, if you see anyone suspicious, call the FBI. The lights went on and all of my classmates had moved their seats away from me. <laughs> so this was during the time when people were building bomb shelters and whatever, you know, there was uh, a difficult, kind of period where I wasn't sure. I thought I was white essentially, but it turns out maybe I was uh, the enemy. Uh, and then we also, we lived in Japan on a US military base in which everybody on the base was from Arizona and Alabama and Nebraska, uh, places I didn't know anything about. And then all of the outside of the base and all the service people were Asian. So this was my first exposure to Asians and then in a large group. And then we moved to Hawaii, which was 70% Asian. Uh, and so I've grown up in sort of this multi-racial, uh, multicultural mishmash. And what it taught me, I think, was to just be very understanding and aware um, of what other people are like and to try to fit in, to try to figure out what makes people tick. Uh, and I think that came in handy. Also, having been the oldest child in a very Asian traditional kind of family, I was the one who had to be responsible for everything. So any misbehavior on the part of my younger siblings was my fault. And I had to keep everyone in line. I also was the liaison for all of the school related or insurance or dental or you know any of those things which required filling out forms which my parents because they were academicians partly and also because of a slight language barrier I was much better at doing it so I was editing uh, my stepmother's master's thesis <laughs> doing all kinds of things at age 12 and 13. Um, so you grow up fast and with this tremendous sense of responsibility for the family, which I think is on the one hand, very Asian um, and helped me a lot over time because I was always the adult in the room, whatever, whatever mm. I did in my yeah. career. Um, but it was also a scary period because my parents were, it was during the McCarthy era. Oh. So uh, everybody who, everyone was suspect. Um, who was not, who was foreign. And so my parents gave us a sense that we had to be really careful and private and not almost secretive and not talk about where we're from or, or any indication that there might be any kind of foreign links um, other than the obvious that we, we were foreign. And so when uh, I protested against the uh, Vietnam War during college, my father was frightened for me because he felt that I was putting myself and everyone else at tremendous risk. Yeah. Uh, and I poo pooed it, having been very Americanized, and then only found out subsequently that actually during the Vietnam War, they did, the FBI did tap a lot of phones of Asians in the United States. Well, oh, they, you know, they've stopped doing that, of course, right? <laughs> you know, uh, yes. China Initiative uh, and, and all this other with, stuff. Yeah, I think- With the Chinese scientists. Yeah, but we should move on. And I, I do think though that uh, I'll comment, uh, you know, Amy, our parents, you know, uh, uh, were sort of like yours, but opposite. In other words, 
our father was like your mother and our mother was like your, your you know, uh, father. In other words, my father was the strict, you know, you have to study hard, don't go into sports, don't go into government, just study hard and you be either a professor or a scientist doctor and that's it, right? And, and my mother was more, you know, more like your father, which is strict, get A's, but oh, by the way, you know, figure yourself out. And I think that's probably fairly common uh, among parents generally, but certainly among Asian American parents that, that you know, that, that there's a clash of, of, of philosophies, right? So, um, you know, it's interesting though, one of the reasons why I just did this as a storytelling is it's, it's impossible to generalize, right? You know, because when you, you just listen, you know, generation to generation, if it's immigrant, not immigrant, if it's this and that, it's impossible to generalize. So that's why what I tried to do was to have a panel where some people who have different backgrounds can talk about things and the audience can take away what they think is useful and, and but not take things that they think they don't relate to. But this thing, the generational, I mean, Alice was talking about uh, this communist thing. So what, well, swap out now for a different set of things. It's different, you know, because time has passed, right? So do you think, you know, one of the big theories is that um, immigrant fa Chinese American families, because they have cultural biases about study hard, you know, uh, uh, just succeed, don't, don't, you know, step out of line, uh, go into engineering and so forth. Do you feel that the theory that that has inhibited uh, people from succeeding beyond, you know, not, not getting into college, but beyond that, do the, do the four of you feel that that is true from your own experiences and, and, and the people you know? Sunil and, and Rika? Uh, I don't think so. I, I think uh, the there are some isolated incidents for sure. And they def definitely get amplified and what have you, but the success rate of Asians in America is far, far greater than the population uh, proportion. And the, uh, the, the colleges, in fact, are now being accused of reverse discrimination. Uh, and maybe it was the selection process. The early immigrants from England and Germany and France and Italy were the oppressed. The, the, the immigrants who came from Asia were not the oppressed. They were the, the more fortunate ones. Your, your parents came as diplomats or and uh, even most Indian Americans came from upper middle class or even upper class families. From, uh, so to that extent, they came with a natural advantage. Now, uh, in my opinion, we should not uh, overreact to the incidents. We should certainly be aware of them and be do everything we can to bring attention to any form of discrimination. But I don't think we should come to any kind of a conclusion that uh, uh, there is a natural uh, tendency of uh, the majority of the population to resent immigration. You know, I, one of the comments that Amy rightly made was that a lot of our history uh, or things which are important to humanity were invented in China and uh, very, very few, some in India too, but largely in China. Uh, however, everything important to humanity in the last 100 years has been invented only in America whether it is e-commerce or, or the latest vaccines or uh, uh, jet engine. When you look at it, the uh, invention rate or the contribution to humanity rate in America is so profound and so big, and it is somewhat related to the uh, infusion of talent, you know, whether it is Jewish Russians or whether it is uh, Chinese Americans or, or lately some Indian Americans, they have contributed more than their fair share to success here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. But uh, I would disagree a little bit with you, Sunil, mm -hmm. in the sense that I think that there is still a great deal of discrimination yeah. in the yeah. United States. And I think it's across, it's better than it used to be. But when you think about the people who were very successful in, let's say, in the past 20, 30 years, generally, it was people like you, engineers, scientists, whatever, 
who couldn't get the top jobs at Bell Labs or the, the, the best of the American companies. They were not going to be considered for the senior management CEO positions. Uh -huh. So they went out and started their own companies and were very successful. Uh -huh. Yeah. And even now, you see, they're very only recently have there been actors and directors and whatnot in the entertainment field um, who are Asian Americans. So I, I believe that there's still a tremendous amount of yeah. discrimination. There is, um, there is a cultural piece of it. I uh, chaired a, a diversity advisory committee for one of the major um, accounting firms when they were trying to figure out why they're senior Asian American, black American, whatever, we're not getting the top posts. And it turns out that some of it was because people put their heads down and worked really hard, but didn't yes. raise their hand, be outspoken, you know, be noticed because culturally they felt that, you know, someone should say I'm the best in the room. I feel too embarrassed to say I'm the best in the room. That doesn't fit into my um, personality. And as a result, they didn't get into the conversations. I found that, um, and, and the first wave of immigrant, you know, let's say Amy and my um, group of second generationers, we weren't, at least I certainly wasn't encouraged to go into sports, to go into uh, extracurricular activities. Yeah. Uh, because my parents didn't realize that those were important. And so I found in business, when I went out into the world, I didn't know how football was played. I couldn't talk with the guys about some of the basic social skills that you kind of need in business in the United States. Maybe you got it in the small towns in Arkansas and whatnot, mm -hmm. just talking with people, but you know that wasn't something. Um, so I think those are kind of important yeah social skills um, that were, were really are useful and weren't encouraged at least culturally, you know, for first, second generation immigrants. Um, that's changed, of course, in the third generation dramatically. Um, so the situation for my children is completely different. Um, but I literally had to read up, a, you know, football for dummies when my son started playing football because I had no clue as to what the rules were. I want to jump in because I it's perfect. Uh, I so much agree with Alice and um, a couple things that Peter and Alice said, I actually think this is the hardest time to be an Asian American uh, and a Chinese American. You know, it's I, I so yes, it's obviously discrimination is a little bit better compared to like the Asian Exclusion Act or something. but. <laughs> You know, for for now, it's it's like Asians are a threat. So it's for me teaching on campus. It's Asians are being there's violence against Asians. Old Asians are being kicked, and yet on a college campus, there's a strong sentiment that you don't complain. You, there's not you know compared to other forms of racism directed to other groups, you can't speak. It's coming from the left and the right. There's fear of China, and then also fear of Asians taking up all the college spots. And so for me, the strong part, the, the, what I got from my parents that I tried to instill, the, the good part is the grit. I applied to 100 law schools to be a professor. This is not to get into schools, but on the teaching market. And I got 100 rejections. And I remember calling my dad and saying, dad, I know you wanted me to be a professor, but I just got 100 rejections and I don't think I'm cut out for this. And my dad's response was, I remember he was like, wait, you got 100 rejections and you want to quit? Like he thought that was a low number, right? I mean, he just couldn't believe it. But but the, on the discrimination thing, I will say that um, it's a really tough time right now. You know, for if there are young people or parents out there, like it was straightforward in our day. Like I, I, I sort of feel like maybe people should forget about Harvard and Yale now, right? It's, it's, it's clearly the rules are changing all the time. Do the SATs count? And I see a lot of my students who come from different schools, you know, maybe you go to graduate school at Ivy League or maybe not, you know, and and the last thing I'll say to support what Alice said, I was myself, I'm the most controversial person here. I, I don't try to be, but I keep ending up that way. Um, How could you say I, that, Amy? <laughs> I just in the last five years found myself in the middle of all these controversies. And, you know, when I was little, I was kind of taught 
There's not, forget discrimination, just work harder. Stop complaining, you can always work harder. And literally I'm about to turn 60 and I, I feel that I was treated in a way that was, you wouldn't treat non-Asians, you know, I just, so it's weird to have this experience and I'm a, an established person. So just in the last three years, I have had to fight back in a quote unquote non-Asian way. Because like I was always told, don't make waves, keep your head down, be nice. But I just felt I had to defend myself and it was so unpleasant. I didn't feel, I felt so lonely. Um, and I think that the, it has to be that way though, you know? So, so anyway, this is, uh, this is kind of what I, I think is a negative. Like I, I, I had to kind of, to defend myself, I had to not do anything my parents taught me to do and just really stand up for myself. Well, let, let me ask the, the, uh, the related question to what you're saying, Amy. So I do believe you're correct that there's an unusually high level of discrimination and so racism against aimed at Asian American, uh, Asian Americans. For two questions. One is, does that translate into barriers to promotion? In other words, I mean, racism and so forth can affect all parts of your life, right? But do 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 you feel that it's affecting the ability for Asian Americans to rise up in organizations? But second, have you? have you dealt with this issue with your own children, right? Have you talked about this issue with them explicitly about discrimination and the effect it has on their careers? Because the theme here is, you know, career ceilings, right? So those two questions, you know, directed at any, any of the panelists. My kids, um, so, um, yeah, you know, I would have answered this question in some ways differently, even just like five years ago. So, um, uh, you know, in, in some ways I've had the luckiest career. I teach at Yale Law School, I have very popular classes. I've, I mean, America has been very, very good to me. But uh, again, just recently, I it's weird towards the end of my career, I'm about to turn 60 to really feel like, whoa, I am a permanent outsider. No matter how well I'm doing, I am an outsider at Yale Law School. I just am not the same as all these other people, you know, um, and it's weird to feel this way. And I'm not even saying it as a complaint. Being an outsider has helped me in many ways. Um, as to my own children, they are some, I, I'm married to a Jewish guy. And in some ways they, my kids are very, very American. They're very outspoken. Um, I, uh, so I'm, I, I almost feel like they are very different from me. Um, and that was what I was going to say earlier. Like I, for me, in being a parent, I found that it is impossible to replicate the immigrant experience. I tried to be like my parents, but I just couldn't do it with my own kids. Because first of all, they were much more privileged. Not They didn't grow up rich, but they had a lot more. So I, I grew up with the sense really like, if you don't get a straight A's, you could starve to death. And they meant it. You know, they really meant it. Like you could be out in the streets. When I say, you know, when I would say things like that to my kids, they're like, are you kidding? You know? Yeah. But did, were they, by the way, uh, do they feel like they're being viewed as Asian or because they're half Asian, half Caucasian, it's not really working out that way? In other words, you know, is race a, a factor? in their own careers and their own you know, acceptance by society. My kids definitely feel a lit, I feel this is a success. They still feel a little bit of that outsider-ness. Mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, you know, depending on whether they straighten their hair or not, or whether it's dyed blonde, like my younger daughter, <laughs> um, they, they either look Asian or not Asian. Um, you know, they they have that kind of look. Of, I don't know, it's, it's uh, what do you, Peter, maybe I can um, give my experience. My two kids um, are both uh, very tall. I'm married to a white person. The last name is short, tall. So they, um, the middle name is Young, but you know, Young is not a particularly Chinese uh, name spelled out. So on the one hand, they went through school where no one assumed that they were Asian unless I was there with them or they would talk about it. And um, so they could pass as it were. Um, but what I found wonderful is that 
just the way we raised them, they didn't want to pass. Um, they were very proud of being Asian. Uh, they loved the traditions. Um, they love Asian Chinese food, but all kinds of Asian food. Um, they identify themselves, self-identify as Hapa, but the, part Asian. But the society, the, and the societal so, issue, the society treat them at all as Asians? Well, because society doesn't really know that they are oh, Asian, half. Yeah, yeah. They don't, you know, unless so, they point it out, it's so, not, yeah, so it's not it, noted. It's nice that they have feeling about Asian, but the reality is in terms of this topic, society is not discriminated because they don't know. They don't know that they're Asian, right? Uh, Sunil and Kumar. Yeah, our, our, kids, uh, I mean, uh, our kids do feel there is strong discrimination in America, but it's not against Asians, it's against Blacks. So, so our kids are fighting all the time for Black Lives Matter and they're persuading us really to say you guys need to fight systemic racism against African-Americans. But that's where there are all these cases of policemen killing uh, a black man without questioning him. So the issue of discrimination really is strong when it comes to African-Americans. Now, from an Indian viewpoint, there's one uh, angle or aspect which probably does not apply to people of Chinese ethnicity, and that is Indian Americans faced a lot of discrimination in their own home country. So before they came here, based on the language or the caste or what region they were from, they were got, getting cut out of a lot of job opportunities. So when they came to America, they felt liberated. They said, my God, nobody even asks me what language my mother spoke or what kind of region I was born in. So to them, this was a liberation. And, and the results speak. I mean, the, the number of CEOs of Indian origin in the recent past, I'm not just talking about Google or American or Microsoft or now FedEx uh, is, is very high. Yeah. So in the private sector, it's very hard to make a case that there well, is discrimination. Let, let, me, let, me, let, let me challenge your, your comment there. First of all, uh, a number of experts who uh, we had webcasts for did say there's a big difference in the success rate career-wise between Indian Americans, uh, East Asians, et cetera, and that Indian, in, there are more CEOs relative to the population uh, uh, who are Indian, you know, and look at it, you know, look at the, 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 the Fortune 500. The problem about you, you say about African Americans is, I think there are two really two issues. There was a big push to get a lot of African Americans into leadership positions in business. And so they've actually succeeded, but sadly below certain levels into society. So there's a, tri a, a tremendous amount of, 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 of uh, uh, discrimination. So it's a very odd situation, right? Where African Americans are uh, partly because societal push to get them promoted in, uh, you know, like uh, in, 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 in the ranks of leadership, but it's not necessarily translated in terms of how African Americans are treated in general society. That's right. That's you know, right. I, I think there's a distinction. So you have to make a distinction about, uh, you know, about, about these things. One of the question is- And Peter, I just have to make one point, which is that the poorest demographic in New York City is the Cambodian popular. It's Asians, mm -hmm. not Blacks, not Hispanic Latinos. And so there is this kind of uh, assumption that Asians are doing better financially across the United States. And that is not accurate either. Yeah, but, but I want to take income away from career success, right? Because they're not necessarily the same issue, right? And what we're, sure. trying, to we're trying to focus here is on career success. What are the factors related to being Asian American and immigrant and so forth that are affecting the career success of that? Because quite frankly, you know, if you're a very successful documentary, uh, you know, director, you don't make a whole lot of money. So I wouldn't take income as a proxy for career uh, success. Let, let me ask this question. What do you feel, do you feel that the Asian American community, and it could be by, by different ethnic groups or whatever, 
is doing what it needs to do in terms of helping Asian Americans succeed uh, in, in terms of their, their careers. Because this is partly a family and partly a community issue, right? I mean, and we know there are certain communities that are very powerfully addressing this issue among the people in their ethnic group, and there are others who are not, right? And uh, I mean, I think the Jewish community clearly bands together to try to help other you know, young people who are Jewish succeed career-wise, right? So do you feel, and, and the answer may be different depending upon what Asian group you're talking about, but do you feel, how do you feel about the Asian community's uh, efforts to try to help uh, the generation succeed? I think, it's, I think it's very difficult and not going so well. Partly, first, the Asian community is so diverse and so, um, even just within Chinese Americans, say, first generation, second generation, and third generation have completely different interests and views, actually. So they're not even, you know, so the younger ones care much more about Black Lives Matter and actually are completely against the Harvard discrimination case. And so people feel very differently. And secondly, again, it's really hard because of the geopolitics and the sense that Asians, as Alice says, are already doing so well to actually advocate. I, I would say that my, I wasn't going to talk about my own children because like Alice says, they kind of pass for white. Um, but I teach a lot of Asian American students and there is no question that there is a ceiling. I can see, or just look at the Oscars right now, or the Pulitzers, or what's, it's there, or, or, and Indian Americans are a little bit different than East Asian Americans. If you look at partners in law firms, I remember hearing about Alice Young. She was my idol. I was at Harvard and, and, and she, I just, I, I remember I have a letter I wrote to her back then, but Alice, the numbers haven't gotten that much better. It, it's not that much better, you know, and I mean, you were an icon, but I can barely think of any other Asian women partners in major law firms. And it's been a long time. Yeah, that's right. Uh, anyone else comment about the Asian American community and, and its- Yes, it's, yes, I think it's important. It was sort of mentioned or alluded for, and I'm very happy about the next program we're hosting about how to run for office. It's very important for Asian Americans to run for more offices in Congress and hopefully even Senate. You know, two Indian Americans ran for governor and both won, and that to in Southern states, South Carolina and Louisiana. So it can be done. So the, uh, the, the being able to promote uh, in, in, in Congress in particular, in Senate it is harder because of some uh, the way Senate elections are run, uh, but, but governorships, I'm very happy you mentioned the Governor Locke and uh, and Congress, that, that's important. Second is journalism. We just don't have enough uh, youngsters taking journalism as a career, which would give them an opportunity to be uh, noticed and seen more. Yeah. Well, I, I do think, Sudhu, you're right that there's some big differences by profession. There, there where the success of Asian Americans is very different depending upon what profession you're talking about. And certainly yeah. running for office is one area where we just don't have that many. Yeah. We don't have much representation yeah. uh, in various you know, uh, uh, government positions. And, and that, by the way, is also a community thing, which is there's no support system, very little support system for helping people figure out how to run for office mm -hmm. among Asian Americans. Uh, the Latinos, the Blacks, et cetera, have huge national uh, organizations that try to help people to figure out what are the election laws so forth. We don't have that in Asia. Peter, we do, we do. There are a number of Asian American organizations and coalition organizations that are specifically focused on helping Asian Americans to run for office, to go for administrative positions, um, I, I know that there are a number of, you have to look a little no, bit, no, 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 but I, there are. I, I, also, what I do want to say though, is what's happening now is um, communities, Asian American communities are getting much better at setting up activities and coalitions with other minority populations or the Jewish um, who have been very successful in fundraising and building understanding. And there's now a push to get Asian American history in the public schools. 
to really learn about the history that's been erased from, from really Amer you know, American schools. And I'm very proud to say New Jersey is, is the second state to mandate Asian American history in the public schools after Illinois. These are things that were pushed by a coalition of Asian Americans, starting with a tiny little group in Montclair, New Jersey called AAPI yeah. Montclair. Well, so well. I think this is the trend. When you listen to someone like Michelle Wu, uh, mayor of Boston, you realize that she didn't get there just because of the Asian Americans. She built over years a coalition uh, and that's the kind of thing we have to learn from and then really help others with. And it is happening, but the resources yeah. are not as great as in other communities. So I'm going to disagree with you because my point was- <laughs> What a surprise. <laughs> no, 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 the, no. Factually, it's I was making a relative comment. In other words, I wasn't saying that there aren't some organizations help, trying to help Asians uh, run for office. I was talking on a relative basis and you said it's hard to find them. So it's hard to find them, right? So, you know, uh, I, I, you know, I wanna make sure you understand that it's only on a relative basis that I'm making that comment. Uh, the, the other- yeah. at the, at the Asian Americans much, are coming no, to no, this. No, 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 they, they have a lot more uh, uh, effort in that area. And in fact, uh, Maylee Tom, who was a Committee 100 member, was the, set up a, a training in California to help train people who are interested in running for office. And then once they're in office, how they, how to succeed in office. Yeah. But she said, it doesn't exist. That kind of thing doesn't exist in any meaningful way anywhere in the country. Whereas the, the, the other ethnic groups have. So we need to help ourselves. So part of this is we need to help ourselves more than we are today, right? In order to succeed. Um, now we are we are moving to the last hour. Strangely enough, uh, <laughs> we have a huge amount of commentary of people commenting to each other, but we only have one question, and uh, and the, here is a question from Lynn: Did did Alice and Amy choose to study law because it was something they were interested in doing, or, be, or because in America, being a lawyer or doctor are both considered to be prestigious? And that, okay, that's sort of related to our, our topic. Question. Uh, well, I'll, um, I'll start since I'm the older <laughs> one of the, of the two of us. Um, as, as I mentioned earlier, my, my family abhorred lawyers. So I certainly didn't go into law because I thought I would get their approval uh, or that they thought it was prestigious to do so. Um, I got into law by default, which was that when I was um, in my senior year at Yale, it was during a period of Black Panther trial, um, anti-war um, protests and whatnot. None of us wanted to uh, go to business school uh, because that was the, the machinery that was causing all, all of the bad things that were happening along with government. Uh, and I was reluctant to go into a PhD program at Harvard in history, having watched my parents and felt that um, academia was a lot of criticism and dog fights and whatnot for not very much money. And I needed money because I had scholarships and needed to pay things back. So law school seemed to me to be um, a way to kind of put off decision-making in a sense. Okay. Uh, and so that's why I did it. In the end, though, it turns out that, uh, as Amy alluded to, uh, it wasn't an easy path because they looked at me and said, why is this young Asian woman, when we're all white men, um, coming into law? And so I was not greeted with open arms. And I had to fight my way to the position that I got. I tried to fight for everyone else, but for to come after me and um, hopefully succeeded in many respects. But it still uh, is Amy, you're terrible. Amy, yeah, uh, yeah we're running out of yeah, time. Yeah, just Amy. very quickly, uh, I uh, not only default, I became a lawyer by despair. Um, you know, I my parents, I had no choice. I had to go to graduate school. <laughs> that was just a not, you know, and I I I, I faint at the sight of blood. I I couldn't stand medicine. Uh, you didn't want to do business just because I wasn't talented in it. And uh, 
So it was the only thing I could think of. And a little bit different from Alice, I was not a talented lawyer. So I'm very lucky to teach in the law. But if you look at what I write, it's more like political science and foreign policy. I just, I was in crisis for almost <laughs> until I was about 35, really trying to find my place in the law. So it was, it was really, <laughs> Uh, you know, one of the downsides of just not fit, not, I wish I'd been able, I should have, I think I could have been a good psychologist or something. Um, but I just felt like there were only a very few options available to me. Look, we've, we reached the end of the hour and, and I just want to uh, wrap up by really saying uh, one comment, which is, although I think the four panelists, uh, you know, have had varied experiences, either as immigrants or, or children and so forth. In a funny way, this panel is both useful because maybe there's some lessons that may still apply, but also useless because times keep, things keep changing, right? And, you know, so I think I encourage you audience to say, look, um, be a little skeptical of both, listen to what these panelists have said. And if there's some things that ring true to you, in your current environment, in the current situation, uh, you know, learn from them. But some of the things, quite frankly, are probably not relevant just because time has passed, right? And what it was like, like Alice says, what it was like to be a, a starting lawyer when she started lawyers is, is different today. So I think, you know, this is a challenge of this topic because you, you got a moving, everything's moving, at, uh, you know, at the same time. But I hope that all of you uh, carried, you know, away a few lessons and perspectives that you can apply in your own lives, whether you as an attendee are either a parent, an immigrant, uh, a, a, a child of an immigrant, uh, or raising kids in, in the current environment. So I want to thank the four panelists. I have to tell you, uh, you know, someone made a note here saying, why don't we make this into a movie? I think we could make this into a Netflix series and everyone could binge watch, I think, if, uh, if we did it. So I want to thank all four of you. And I want to encourage uh, those of you uh, who are attending to please uh, attend the one on running for office on April 19th. And as Sunil says, you, we got to get more people running for office because at the end of the day, if we don't change laws, and be more visible in the in the legislative side, um, we still won't get there. So thank you all, and uh, thank you very much to our four panelists. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Peter. Thank you everyone, Thanks, for joining. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye.